Paul. Uh, Mr. Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and it's nice to see you again, Mr. Greenspan. I have just a, a few questions that I would like to ask Mr. Greenspan. Uh, in, 1990, in 1973, the average American worker earned $502 a week. In 1998, with a good increase, I should add, over 97, the average weekly income was $442, 12 percent less than in 1973. So if the average worker is earning 12 percent less in 98 compared to 73, if the typical married couple is now working 247 hours more in 1996 than in 1989, we're seeing people all over this country working two or three jobs, et cetera, I don't quite understand, maybe I live in a different world than some of my colleagues, how the economy is booming. That's question number one. Number two, we talked a little bit about the distribution of wealth. The wealthiest 1 percent of our population now owns more wealth than the bottom 95 percent. One man, as I understand it, owns more wealth than the bottom 40 percent of our population. CEOs now earn over 400 more, more money, 400 times more money than do their workers. And we continue to have, by far, the most unequal distribution of wealth in the entire world proliferation of millionaires, 22 percent of our children living in poverty. Please be as direct as you can in a moment. How do we address this growing inequality of wealth and income in this country? Thirdly, you made a statement a moment ago, I thought I heard you say about the feeling that income distribution was leveling out. I have in front of me a recent CBO report that just came out last week, and what it says is that between 91 and 99, the top 1 percent top 1 percent of family income went from 12 percent to 15 percent, a very significant increase, whereas every other quintile, lowest, second, middle, fourth, saw a decline in their percentage of the income. Maybe you'll comment on that, Mr. Chairman. I would like to submit that chart to the record. It seems that income distribution in this country is not leveling out, but the rich are continuing to gain uh, more and more. <coughs> The other question I have is that a couple of years ago, you and I dialogued, and I know you were public on this, about your views on the minimum wage. You and some other people argued that if we raised the minimum wage from four and a quarter an hour to 515, there would be more unemployment and more inflation. Uh, the fact of the matter is that unemployment now is lower than it has perhaps been in many years. There is virtually no inflation. Is it still your view? that we should not raise the minimum wage so that our lowest, lowest wage workers can escape from poverty. Uh, you, a moment ago, I think, reiterated your views on capital gains tax cuts. Uh, it seems to me that the evidence is pretty clear, however, uh, that capital gains tax cuts primarily benefit the wealthiest, wealthiest Americans. According to an analysis by Citizens for Tax Justice, the wealthiest 10 percent of all Americans would enjoy more than 90 percent of the capital gains tax cuts in the House tax bill, which is before us today. If we are honestly concerned about addressing the growing gap between the rich and the poor, why would we give upper income people the lion's share of tax cuts? Bottom line of my questioning, Mr. Greenspan, is I do not agree with my friends here. I do not agree with what I see on television every day. <coughs> that the economy is booming for the middle class and the working families of this country. I think people are stressed out. They're working incredibly long hours. In many instances, they're working for low, lower real wages than was the case before. I think we have an obscene, obscenely unfair distribution of wealth in this country where so few have so much and so many have no health care, uh, having a hard time sending their kids to college. So those are a few of the points uh, that I would very much appreciate your, your speaking about. Congressman, let me come at this seriatim. First of all, the uh, numbers you're using on a decline in the average worker's income, uh, I believe come from a uh, faulty set of data that have been published by the BLS and that if you look at real per capita income, you indeed find that there is significant growth and that uh, this is a statistical problem which we've been struggling with for a while as to what to do with that set of data. Secondly, on the CBO numbers, I was referring to the last two years.
the numbers you were referring to or the CBO was referring to are the last eight years. Indeed, from 1991 to 1997, I suspect that that is correct. It has not been correct in the last couple of years where the increased concentration, as best I can judge, has not been occurring. It's stabilized and may even have flattened out. We do not yet have detailed data for this year, and as a consequence, it can only be a conjecture. I merely reflect it of the fact that uh, uh, looking at, as I indicated earlier, the unemployment rate in those who tend to be in the lower income groups, that my impression is that when those data come out, uh, that uh, you will find in the last couple of years that the economy has had an extraordinarily positive effect in this direction. On the issue of wealth and the like, uh, let me just say that uh, the crucial question I think you have to answer is whether or not if somebody gets wealthy, it's at your expense. This is not a zero-sum game. What we have seen is a very dramatic increase in overall wealth in the United States. And while I do not deny that there are very major uh, holdings of wealth by individuals, it's by no means clear to me that these have in any way been extracted from other people in the society. They are the consequence of new ideas, new wealth creation, and have been fundamental factors in pulling the whole economy up. And I would in no way consider that that is a negative force in a free society that we, uh, that we experience and I hope enjoy. On the issue of the minimum wage, I still hold to what I said previously. I never argued, nor would I, that in a period of forced draft uh, pressures in the labor market, which is indeed what we have been saying recently, that you find any result from the minimum wage uh, on the issue of employment. Indeed, I think that uh, it is very unlikely when these labor markets are as tight as they are that the minimum wage has a significant effect in preventing people from coming on the lower ends of the economic ladder to get a job. My concern is when the labor markets begin to weaken, that those people who cannot are not allowed by law to accept a wage beneath a certain number can find no job. As a consequence, they do not get, the, get on the first rung of the ladder, cannot achieve job skills, cannot achieve the self-esteem that is necessary to move up the ladder. And I do not perceive that the minimum wage is something which is a benevolent force for people in the lower part of our income groups. I frankly think that it is something which deprives them of gaining what they should be obtaining by right. And I do not consider the minimum wage as a positive force in our society. I think it is precisely counterproductive to what you suggest it is trying to do. Well, I, I certainly wish we had the time to engage so in, a, in a dialogue on this, because I think you're wrong in, in many instances. And I, I would just simply say, Mr. Chairman, that I think there is something profoundly wrong when we read in the papers last week, the Washington Post, some 40,000 kids in, the, in this city, in the District of Columbia, go hungry. At a, and, and at the same time, we have a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires, and there are those who want to cut back on taxes for the richest people and therefore cut back on programs like nutrition programs. I think that's wrong and fundamentally flawed. Mr. McCall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman Greenspan, in the section of your testimony,